Have you ever heard the phrase, what goes around comes around? Welcome to Through the Bible. We see the ultimate example of that in our last study in the book of Judges. You know, history has once again come full circle. Dr. McGee calls it the hoop of history. If you can, open your Bible to Judges chapter 17, and as you get settled into your seat on the Bible bus, we got a special introduction from Dr. McGee. Miracle drugs actually are not new. They go way back. As someone has said, Moses had two tablets that could cure the world. Well, the problem was that a great many miracle drugs, people are allergic to them, and mankind has been allergic to the two tablets that Moses had. And we find in the book of Judges that we have little man. I have treated this almost in a humorous vein because these men are little men, oddballs. No leadership. Israel had no leadership. They had sunk down deep in gross immorality. And finally, God did have to give them a king to rule over them. He wanted to do that, but they asked for a king. And friends, I wonder if you recognize the route we are going today. We have today new morality, which means old sin, old immorality. And this new morality is rebellion against God. We have what is known as situation ethics, and we see mankind today moving away from God. How tragic it is as we look at our nation, and in this year, when there are no George Washingtons or Thomas Jeffersons or Patrick Henrys or men of that caliber, John Witherspoon and John Hancock, we lack leadership today. What's the next step? Well, the next step is a strong man. That's the way it's been in the history of the world. America must have a revival or else we shall continue on the downward path. Heavenly Father, today we take these few moments to pray for our nation. We pray especially for our leadership, that they might turn to you. And we pray that somehow or another that the Spirit of God may move upon this sinning nation and bring us back to thyself. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue to pray for the spiritual health of our nation and for our president and executive leadership. We commit these things to God now. Here's Dr. J. Vernon McGee with today's study in Judges, beginning in chapter 17. Now, as we come here to the 17th chapter, and from chapter 17 through 21, we have here the philosophy of history that we mentioned at the very beginning. We've seen it illustrated in this book in the hoop of history that rolls down through time. And it started off with the nation Israel in the place of blessing. Then they began a departure from God. They followed their own way. They were sold into slavery. And in their slavery and servitude, they cried out to God. Then they turned to God and repented. And God raised up judges, delivered them. Then they came back to the place of blessing of a nation serving God. And, oh, oh, here they go again. And they began to do evil and turn from God. Now, that gives us this philosophy of history that every nation that goes down, goes down in this order. There is first religious apostasy. Second, there is moral awfulness. And third, there's political anarchy. It begins in the temple, then the home, then the state. That's the way a nation goes down. Now, in chapter 17 and 18, we see religious apostasy, the temple. We read in verse 1 of chapter 17 of Judges, And there was a man of Mount Ephraim whose name was Micah. And he said unto his mother, 
the eleven hundred shekels of silver that were taken from thee, about which thou cursest and speakest of also in mine ears, behold, the silver's with me. I took it, and his mother said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. Now, here is an example of a spoiled brat. Micah is a son of a mother that has spoiled him. He's mama's boy. And when he saw that she was saving up this money, why, he decided to steal it. And then he took it, and it must have bothered him. Then he told her what he had done. Instead of her turning him across her knee and applying the Board of Education to the seat of knowledge, well, she congratulated him. She said, Blessed be thou the Lord, my son. And when he had restored the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, Now notice, they've gone off into idolatry. I had wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord from my hand for my son to make a graven image and a molten image. Now, therefore, I will restore it unto thee. And then she turns around and gives it to him to make an image, and she said she dedicated it unto the Lord. You know, there are a lot of Christians today that are just that inconsistent. She said, I'm dedicating it to the Lord, but we're making an idol using it for that. And I find a great many Christians, I've been rather amused at some of these youth groups. You know, they take up an offering and they say it's for the Lord. And then they use most of it for the social on Friday night that they all can enjoy. Dedicated to the Lord, but actually dedicated to the God of pleasure, to hedonism, if you please, not to God at all. And that's what you have here. Now, what happened was this man Micah, with that money, was apparently able to not only make one molten image, but we're told in verse 5, and the man Micah had a house of gods, that is, of images, and made an ephod and teraphim and consecrated one of his sons who became his priests. Now notice, in those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Now this is the place they've come to, and that'll be repeated several times. In fact, the last verse of this book. Every man does that which is right in his own eyes. Now we find that this man, Micah, had a son. It's all a family affair. And I guess that bothered him a little. But this is what happened. Verse 7 now of Judges 17. That was a young man out of Bethlehem, Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite, and he sojourned there. And the man departed out of the city from Bethlehem, Judah, to sojourn where he could find a place. And he came to Mount Ephraim to the house of Micah as he journeyed. Now he is an itinerant preacher, by the way. And Micah said unto him, Whence comest thou? And he said unto him, I'm a Levite of Bethlehem, Judah, and I go to sojourn where I may find a place. And Micah said unto him, Dwell with me, and be unto me a father and a priest, and I will give thee ten shekels of silver by the year, and a suit of apparel, and thy vittles, room and board. So the Levite went in. Now, this is a hired preacher, if you please. Here's the hired preacher that is the messenger boy of a board or of a little group. And God have mercy on a church that has that kind of a preacher. And so here is this Levite here just has become now a priest, but he's got a house full of idols. And the Levite was content to dwell with the man. And the young man was unto him as one of his sons. So the Levite, you know, sort of took the boy in. But he didn't condemn his idolatry. And Micah consecrated the Levite. The young man became his priest and was in the house of Micah. Then said Micah, Now know I that the Lord will do me good, seeing I have a Levite to my priest. Now this is certainly a revelation of the low spiritual ebb that the nation had sunk to. Here is a man that thinks if he just has a Levite, an ordained preacher, that that's all that he needs. How tragic it is. And yet this man expects the blessing of God upon him. And how many are like that today? Now, in another one of the tribes, this was Ephraim, in the tribe of Dan, which was way in the north, 
chapter 18, verse 1, begins like this. In those days, there was no king in Israel. You see, this was a time of utter confusion, no leadership. And in those days, the tribe of the Danites sought them an inheritance to dwell in, for under that day all their inheritance had not fallen unto them among the tribes of Israel. And you'll recall that in the book of Joshua, that none of these tribes got all the land that was coming to them. And that certainly was true of the tribe of Dan, way in the north. They had a real problem. And you will remember, they took to the hills. And the children of Dan sent of their family five men from their coast, men of valor, from Zorah, from Eshtaal, to spy out the land and to search it. And they said unto them, Go search the land, who when they came to Mount Ephraim, to the house of Micah, they lodged there. Now these men went to see what territory that the tribe of Dan could take to extend and expand their borders in their own tribe. But in their travels, they came to the house of Micah, verse 3. And when they were by the house of Micah, they knew the voice of the young man, the Levite. He sounded like a preacher. And they turned in thither and said unto him, Who brought thee hither? And what makest thou in this place? And what hast thou here? And he said unto them, Thus and thus dealeth Micah with me, and hath hired me, and I am his priest. He's a hard preacher. God have mercy on the church when it has a hired preacher. That is nothing in the world but a messenger boy to do what a little group wants him to do and does not do what God has called him to do. That is, preach and teach the Word of God without fear, without favoritism, and without compromise. Now, this boy here has really compromised. And this is a period of compromise, corruption, and confusion. And that is the thing that marks apostasy any time. We today are in an apostasy. The church is in the position of compromise, corruption, and confusion. And that is the problem. Not coming back to its authority today, which is the Word of God and the Lord Jesus Christ who's revealed in the Word of God. Now, will you notice these men from Dan, they said, Oh, my, well, here's a priest right here, and we'll speak to him. They said unto him, Ask counsel, we pray thee of God, that we may know whether our way which we go shall be prosperous. And the priest said unto them, Go in peace before the Lord is your way wherein ye go. And my, this is the sweet talk of a hired preacher, <laughs> saying things that they, people want to hear, having itching ears. He wants to hear some compliment. And they want to hear something nice and easy and soft and sweet. And so we have the sweet talk of the hired preacher here. And these five men left. They thought this was great. And verse 10, When ye go, ye shall come unto a people secure, to a large land, for God hath given it into your hands, a place where there is no want of anything that is in the earth. And the very interesting thing why these men went to spy out the land. And what happened? Well, did they enlarge their land? Yes, but what happened? Verse 30, And the children of Dan set up the graven image, and Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, he and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. Now, who is Jonathan? He happens to be the grandson of Moses. Now, here is real apostasy. Friends, you couldn't have it any worse than it is right here. This is apostasy from the days of Moses now to his grandson who is priest and has an idol. They've gone a long ways from God. Moses had said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any likeness. And here the grandson, now is priest of an idol. This is tragic. I wonder if I may say this on the network, and I think it will be all right to say it. I was shocked when I began to study for the ministry and began to learn a few things about the church. I was not brought up in the church. And as a result, 
It was a new world and a new life for me when I began to study for the ministry and found out some things. I had always thought of Dwight L. Moody as being way up there, a real saint of God. And he was, by the way. And then a man who knew him and who knew his family, he said, you know, that one of his sons is in the most liberal organization that's in this country in that day. He was in the old Federal Council of Churches and had an office in that. I said, you don't mean that a son of Dwight L. Moody He said, yes, that's right. And do you know, I never had anything that hurt me as that did as a young man studying for the ministry. I just couldn't understand how a son of a man like Moody could depart from the gospel of Jesus Christ and the integrity and inerrancy of the Word of God. May I say to you, friends, that apostasy is an awful thing. And the problem with any nation begins always in this matter of religious apostasy. This is what has happened now. And you'll notice that it moves on to the second stage. And that second stage is an awful stage, moral awfulness. And we have that story now in chapter 19, and it concerns actually the tribe of Benjamin. And I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail here, but just to look at something that I think is very important. Chapter 19, verse 1, And it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel, that there was a certain Levite sojourning on the side of Mount Ephraim who took to him a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah, Now we have another insight into the life of the people of that day. And this is a good illustration of Romans 1 through 3, by the way. And his concubine played the harlot against him, went away from him unto her father's house to Bethlehem, Judah, and was there four whole months. Now imagine this Levite marrying a woman like that. And she leaves him and goes back to her father's house, plays the harlot, and he went after her. And he took her with him, and as he journeyed, they came into the borders of the tribe of Dan. And they were entertained in a home among the Jebusites, and they were of the tribe of Benjamin at that time that were living in Jebus. And what happened was that when they were being entertained, why the man of the town came in, and they apparently knew something of her reputation to begin with. And what happened was that they, of course, broke in. They absolutely killed her. They apparently raped her and then killed her. Sounds like something that's happening in our country today, does it not? And by the way, the parallel is quite striking as you go through this section. And then what happened was that they killed her, and then they left. And this man, this Levite, was really wrought up. And you know what he did? This reveals how low they were in that day. He took her and cut her up in pieces and sent a piece to each tribe with a message of what it was and what had happened to him. And you know it caused all the tribes to be incensed. They believed the law should be enforced. They hadn't sunk down quite as far as we have today where lawlessness is permitted. And unfortunately, of course, it's made a political football, but also there is a tendency today to, well, we want as little law as possible. And so all the tribes assembled together, and they came against the tribe of Benjamin. And the tribe of Benjamin tried to defend themselves, but they had a tremendous army, apparently. Verse 16 of chapter 20 says this, Among all this people, there were 700 chosen men left-handed, southpaws. Everyone could sling stones at a hair breath and not miss. Now, a great many people think it's miraculous that David was able to hit Goliath right in the eye. I heard a liberal talk about that, 
for 15 minutes that he couldn't have been that accurate. Well, read this verse here. They were as accurate in that day as they are today with the missiles, by the way. They had to be much closer, but if they could get in the range of a uh, slingshot, why, it would be fatal for anyone. These men could split a hair, these left-handed men. And when you come to David, you'll find out. And you remember David took five stones. And by the way, I heard that same liberal say that he thought if he missed with one, he'd use the other. That wasn't it at all. You know why he took five stones? Well, if you read the record very carefully, you'll find out old Goliath had four sons that were sitting over there in the army of the Philistines, and David had a stone for each one of them. David didn't need but one stone for Goliath. He knew how accurate he was, and he knew how he could use it, but they were overcome by sheer numbers, and actually the tribe of Benjamin was almost destroyed. We're told in verse 44 of chapter 20, and there fell of Benjamin 18,000 men. All these were men of valor. Why? Because of the gross immorality that they had sunk to. And we're told in verse 46, so that all which fell that day of Benjamin were 20, and 5,000 men that drew the sword, all these were men of valor. How tragic it was. This is the favorite tribe, Benjamin, the young son of old Jacob, and the favorite, the one that Judah was willing to lay down his life for. And they occupied a place right next to Judah, but this gross immorality that has taken place, and it's set tribe against tribe, class against class. And what has happened now? Well, it leads to political anarchy. The steps are outlined here very clearly. There was first religious apostasy, way up yonder with Micah's image, Micah's idol. And then it ushered in moral awfulness. It reaches from the temple to the home, and then political anarchy. Those are the steps that any nation takes that goes down. I have a statement in a little book of mine. America needs a declaration of dependence, not independence, but dependence. And, of course, that is on God. I took out of the Wall Street Journal way back in 1928 the clipping actually was sent to me, and it states there that what America needed in the Depression at that time was not some economic arrangement or political move, but needed to return to the days when grandfather thought it was good business to take the team out of the field early on Wednesday evening so that the team could be hitched up to the wagon in which grandma put the children with their scrub faces, and they all went off to the little church down at the crossroads for prayer meeting on Wednesday night, and they thought it was good business even in the time of harvest. That was something said by that Wall Street Journal. May I say to you, if that was true then, certainly true today. Where did our trouble begin? Our trouble is primarily spiritual, goes back. Actually, it goes back to the church. The church went into apostasy. Then it's entered the home. And we talk about the drug problem. We talk about the generation gap. Then it's moved up into political anarchy today. And we hear so much about if we could just change this and put this party in. And my friend, all of that is perfect nonsense that we're hearing on television in these days. What we need today is to get back to a spiritual foundation. That's where our trouble began, and that's where we went off the track. God, have mercy on America today. May I say to you, this happens to be the philosophy of history. The hook of history is still rolling, and I'm disturbed because it's never changed, and we are today in the midst of political anarchy. What an amazing time we've had in the book of Judges together. Next time, we begin in the little book of Ruth. 
Dr. McGee called it the romance of redemption because in it we see a perfect picture of Jesus Christ, our kinsman redeemer. You're going to love it. For notes and outlines, visit ttb.org or call us 1-800-65-BIBLES, the number. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll meet you back here next time. Well, ride the Bible bus for five years and you'll be amazed at what God teaches you from His Word about what it means to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It's a blessing that keeps on going. That's what we believe at Through the Bible.